name is Ben, I'm the CTO at BitGo. And uh, so BitGo is like an exchange API that many exchanges like Bitstamp, uh, Corbit, and Upbit use for their wallets. Uh, so we, you know, we do scalability and security. Cool. Yeah, my name is Jake Craig. I uh, also work at Coinbase, I'm senior software engineer on the, the crypto payments engineering team. So we're the team that sort of runs all the blockchain integrations at Coinbase. If you do sends or receives, hot wallet, cold storage, all that kind of stuff goes through our systems. Um, yeah, been working there for a bit, and it's all right. on Ethereum. Cool, and I should probably introduce myself as well. So I'm Eric Scrivener, and I'm also on the crypto payments team with Jake at Coinbase. And uh, he did a pretty good job summarizing what we do there, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And all right, so we'll start with, uh, we'll start with some softball questions here. Uh, all right, so this one uh, is one of my favorite ones. Um, I think this should be asked more at Ethereum and DevCon events in general. Uh, so if you were an EVM opcode, which EVM opcode <laughs> would you be and why? Um, well, I'm on stage in 2018, so I think I have to be the PC opcode. Fair, <laughs> fair enough, all right. What about you? This is interesting because I actually looked up um, the opcodes recently. There's quite a lot of them. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what he's going to say. <laughs> uh, I, I can't have a guess. Anyway, um, <laughs> my favorite opcode is call. All right, all right, I can see that. Oh, okay. oh yeah, and, and the why? Why? Yeah, what do you enjoy about call? Because I think it's what makes Ethereum so interactive and, and you know, okay. expandable. All right, fair enough. And Jake, which one are you going to be? So I've got, I've got two. Um, I think the first got one two. might be what you're guessing. Uh, there is an opcode called Coinbase, which is a very convenient one. Um, but uh, that's not going to be my choice. Uh, my choice is going to be XOR. Which uh, it's just because you know all the new cryptography stuff in Coinbase, like Coinbase, um, in the community coming out and stuff. It's just XOR was what powers basically all that at some level, and it's just a really exciting thing uh, to play with. And it's this very simple thing, but it's just so powerful. All right, no, no one picks self destruct. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's yours. <laughs> all right, that's mine. <laughs> okay, so um, let's kick things off. Let's move. Let's move on to the medium ones here. Okay, so. Um, I really like this first one. So what is the what is your biggest challenge integrating with Ethereum at this moment? Uh, Start with, with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, one huge challenge is A, nonce management in terms of you can have rapidly fluctuating gas prices across the network and if one transaction gets stuck then it slows up all the others and you either have to resend the first one or just Wait it out. That's a, a huge challenge. Yeah, sure. yeah I think uh, we see that as well. It's a pretty uh, common issue when you have very large mm -hmm. wallets. Um, so with you know with large wallets and when in Ethereum, as, as many of you know, the accounts uh, have a nonce, and whenever you create a new transaction, it has to have a nonce, which is monotonically increasing. And the way that it was designed that way is because it's it's a lot easier to to track. Um, and for double spend protection and all that. And so say you know, you, you're you running an exchange or something like that, and you are gonna be sending you know, 10 transactions uh, per five minutes. And um, this, this can be you know, 100 transactions you know, over 50 minutes. And if at transaction number, f number four, uh, you put in a wrong gas price, then by transaction 50, uh, all your transactions can't clear because four isn't cleared. Um, so I think uh, that, that's, a big, that's a big challenge there. Um, you know, do you want to talk about some solutions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, like you said, uh, we, we've all sort of had this issue, and it is one that tends to come up at scale as you're doing just a lot of them back-to-back, -back, right? If you're an individual wallet, you, know, you send one transaction. If it takes a while, maybe that's okay. Um, or you can really easily sort of replace that. There's this sort of replace by fee mechanism. Um, and it, it's an interesting one because like, it sort of depends how you structure your hot wallet as well. Um, there's different ways to do it. Some exchanges, you know, tend to use like a sort of single or a few addresses for everything, so they have a lot of transactions going through that address. Um, other ones use, you know, contracts and stuff, um, or you know, lots of them. Like we, like Coinbase in our wallet, we just basically have just you know hundreds of millions of addresses, and so we always have it all over the place. And so when we hit the situation, it can be fairly limited in scope, but it can affect like a subset of customers. And there's not great solutions for it yet. Um, other than replacing it, which is a solution, but it's a more sort of complicated one to manage, and especially when you've got a lot of these going on. And so this, this thing where sort of the gas prices can spike, 
um, and sort of delay everything is, is really challenging. Um, this example that I, I've seen in our systems before is you know, transaction two minutes apart, same gas price. Uh, one took two minutes to confirm and the other took 13 hours. And that's not a really great way to build you know, systems uh, and to, or to build a business on Ethereum. And so it's a, it doesn't just affect us, it could just affect a business doing this who doesn't have you know, as sophisticated infrastructure to handle. And, and one of the things that we've sort of talked about and seen come up but a few times is you know, this idea that comes from sort of Bitcoin of this child pays for parent style of transaction, where it's a similar mechanism of sort of recovering sort of pending ones that are like chained together in some ways. Like in this case, it's chained by like the nonce, it's different in Bitcoin, but um, the theory is sort of you, you put a new transaction out like on top of all these with a high fee, and then that sort of can subsidize the rest of the lower fees and get it back to closer to what the real network fee is, so miners will pick it up, and they'll pick up all of them at once. So you just send this like transaction with this really high fee, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're maybe you know 50 whatever transactions are all all can get confirmed, and you can sort of recover that and have sort of a better experience for your customers. Um, so that's yeah, that's that's an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a bit about that. So so firstly, you know, RBF uh, like replaced by fee, um, it works today because it's you know you can do it yourself. Um, but one of the larger um, I think confusions with that, uh, you know, when you change the fee, you also change what you're signing, and therefore uh, the TX hash uh, gets changed. So if you're displaying a TX hash, a TX ID to the, the customer of the person receiving the funds, then it, it will be different. Um, with uh, CPFP, uh, it's, you know, well known in, in, in Bitcoin land. Um, the, the, the common challenge is, you know, the idea is uh, you have, 10 transactions not confirmed, so you put another one, transaction 11, and it's got an outsized fee. And the outsized fee uh, helps to tell the miner that, hey, you know, if you want to get this outsized fee, you 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 got to mine all these other 10 first. <clears throat> um, the, the, the challenge for the miner then is how are they going to figure out that, that this string of 10 transactions um, combined with the 11 uh, is really worthwhile for them to mine. Because if they were to do this infinitely, um, like after a thousand and thousand and one transactions, then um, they can run out of memory just waiting for you to come up with another big, uh, you know, fee. You know? Yeah, that was the thing that was brought up. Uh, it came up in Ethereum maybe a few months ago now um, when there was this uh, exchange that was sort of incentivizing lots of volume on the network. Um, so it was just kind of backing up the network. I think this is another sort of big challenge with Ethereum is that individual token sales, individual just new you know games or whatever can like significantly impact the network very very quickly and very fast. They start the token sale, the fees skyrocket. Now everybody in the network is paying more. Any app you built is just now all of a sudden paying more. And, and then now you also, as you know, anybody sending transactions get them stuck because the the estimate can only update once it has all the new data. So you're kind of at this, you can't ever predict it necessarily. Um, you can have some sort of models and like generally it works and it updates fairly quickly, but there is this sort of delay. And that, that was a thing brought up um, when it was started to be talked about in Ethereum a little bit. I, I believe on the parity repo there's an issue that has some sort of proposed model, but they're specifically talking about sort of like DOS vectors and stuff with this, like how long do you track it? What's this buffer? And is that configurable? And how does that actually work? So, so to summarize here, it sounds like like volatility of fees is the the biggest challenge here, and there's no good solution at this point. Is that the is that the deal? There, there's a solution. It's mm -hmm. just a okay. challenging one, I think, because like like uh, Ben said here, the you know transaction has changing and stuff. It's a more complicated thing to like re like match things up. If you you now have sort of two pending transactions with the network, and one of them will confirm, and generally it would be the higher fee one, but like I think in theory, like the lower one can also yeah. confirm. So now you have to have these two sort of states, and like all right, which transaction is real? And then you know one of them will confirm, and so it's, a, it's just a more complicated problem to implement. It okay. does become a potential challenge too, because it's even like child pays for or a parent pays for child, and it's could potentially okay. So now we have, and you kind of touch on this, Ben, where maybe miners run out of run out of memory space when they're waiting for all these pending transactions. Maybe, but if if hypothetically that did exist, if it was implemented poorly, it could lead to this new design pattern where everyone's putting, you know, one GUA or whatever it be as all of their transaction prices and then if it doesn't clear within some X time period, then they put out a transaction to kind of clear those out. So we have this now almost waves of transactions going through just because people want to pay lower their costs, right? So it's, it's a tricky, tricky situation. 
All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's it's so all three of you seem to have consensus on this. Yeah. Well, all this right. is one of one of the things, right? I think another right. one that that's not just us, but I mean, we definitely experience this uh, is just running notes, right? Running notes, <coughs> keeping them up to date, um, the size of, of the yep. backups and stuff. Uh, in particular, the sort of like archive state notes that mm. store like the full history. Um, I think. Afri uh, of you know, Parity just released a website about like that constantly tracks the size. Uh, and so if you run like Parity, you can get it to like 200 something gigabytes, um, but you don't have this sort of full history one. And that one tends to be, I think, around these days 1.8 terabytes or something. Um, and so just the size is a thing of just transferring that over the internet when you need to like spin up a new one just takes a lot of time. I think ours, our, our ones, when we spin them up, are like three, four hours right now to sort of do yeah. that. We've got things to get them faster, but a, a fresh sync is like, I, I think the last one I did yeah. took about a month, a month and a half. <laughs> Something like that, um, yeah. which which kind of flows nicely into the next question, um, which is, uh, do you do you think that integrating with Ethereum is getting harder at that low level that we're talking about here? And uh, if so, do you think that we're at some sort of critical juncture with respect to that? I think for uh, for instance, I mean, the blockchain size keeps increasing every day, so for that purpose, it is getting harder in terms of resyncing nodes or syncing a new node if one crashes or something like that, you lose a database. Um, in a lot of ways though, there's a lot of tooling that makes it a lot easier to integrate things. So things like Truffle or Ganache are becoming really, really easy to use and there's a great user experience around dev workflow now for even just for local development but also for production. And it's, it's this interesting kind of duality. So some parts are getting harder, in my opinion, some parts are getting easier potentially. I think to uh, go to production with Ethereum um, is a little, getting a little bit harder. Uh, I really like the developer on-ramp. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the developer tooling and all the, the you know, building or building <laughs> tools are getting better and better at welcoming new, new, you know, new developers. And that's why we have so many developers at this conference. Um, I think that so far as running a node, uh, when I uh, last fired up, uh, you know, a node for, for myself. You know, we have lots of nodes in production, but uh, sometimes you want to hack yourself. Um, I think Geth, uh, if you you know, running in the, the fast fast mode, it's actually not too bad. Um, and I think it's right now it's not a critical juncture juncture because at this point the the block processing time is still less than the time it takes to to propagate and and, and the time that a block you know gets found and. Um, that, you know, we can talk a bit about more about that, like that was different earlier this year. Um, but I think that right now it's quick where you can fast sync all the way to the head of the chain and then you can just, you know, your blocks are getting processed quick enough with, you know, modern hardware. It's not totally a problem and of course, you know, you really want to be running a, a, a proper archival node in, in, in production and, and running several of them, so that's a different challenge. But uh, to get onboarded, I think it's actually still pretty easy. I agree that like onboarding definitely does, and they're, they're having a lot. There's a lot of really cool stuff there to like get up to speed and like start being able to do things. Um, but like you said, sort of at this sort of like scale thing, or when you're running like businesses that, that are worth a lot of money and a lot of money's moving through, you also want to like have sort of the full history yourself and always have a copy of that. And so you this kind of initial sync time. Well, like I think for a lot of these cases, this is not particularly important or like syncing sort of every block into sort of your own database that so you have sort of your own full history that you can analyze um, outside of, you know, just the sort of latest state. Um, like one of the things we have is our data team wants, you know, full copy of the, the blockchain in, you know, SQL that they can sort of analyze and, and do things with. And um, right now, so we sort of manually build tools that do that kind of stuff. Uh, and just takes a while, right, to just because of the, the pure size. Um, Do we know how big that is? How much? How much data that is? No. Uh, it, it depends on how <laughs> you want to index it. Right. So I think there's this project I saw part of the grant team showcase. It was called Vulcanize DB or something like that. It was pretty cool. Um, you tell them what you want to index, and they they will run it through and put it into a Postgres. Um, I think it's a great idea, and it's nice. It's lowering the bar so that not everyone has to build an indexer. You know, you guys probably build an indexer, and we have an indexer. Um, so everyone's building one, but the more that it can be open source, the better. All right, I've got a, I've got another uh, easier one for you. Well, maybe it's not easy actually. It it could be easy all the way to hard. Uh, so so parity or get or a left if if you like that one. Uh, I'm partial to parity. Um, I found that it's been more reliable and faster sync has been nicer, and we can get into the whole parity trace parsing issue. Um, 
which I'm sure we will. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we, we can definitely we can there. definitely hop into that. Um, yeah, that, that's definitely one advantage Parity had early on. Yeah, well, that, that's what I've heard is, is with Parity, um, what we're sort of ending at here is this idea of if you're on Etherscan, you see contracts sending Ether around. They call them sort of internal transactions. And uh, sort of detecting those and seeing like where money moves is, is a complicated thing. I actually gave a talk on this yesterday. Um, that you know, there'll be a recording of and stuff about sort of the ins and outs of how that works and stuff. Um, but from my, my understanding, I, I wasn't around when this, this happened, but um, Parity was one of the first ones to give an API that made that more like accessible and, and easy to sort of figure out what happened. And, and Geth now, I believe since 1.8 it was, does have an API for this too, but it's not a standardized API. It's, it's actually a custom one for each one, and so there's no standard way to, to process these, and that's, I think, something that would be really interesting to see in the future. Yeah, it's it's interesting because like there there are lots of transactions that happen that appear nowhere in the blockchain, right? And so I think that's one of the interesting differences between Ethereum and a, a lot of other ones. But uh, Ben, what about you? Yeah. Um, so the first question, uh, I think both Parity and Geth. Okay. Um, run them both. Um, depending on what the network situation is, sometimes some of them have challenges processing certain types of transactions and blocks, and some of them. You know, then the other one goes faster, and so I think running both is the way to go. All right, fair enough. Um, with, I think that this is a huge topic: uh, internal transactions. Um, for us, it's one of the largest pain points. Um, so at BitGo, we use multi-sig wallets. These are wallet contracts, smart contracts. And uh, for us, um, when when we send out from the smart contracts, we want the receiver to be able to see the funds easily. Uh, on more modern uh, exchanges, uh, they do, you know, record the deposit um, because they can look at um, these internal transactions. And so, a little bit about internal transactions. So, um, in Ethereum, uh, you have transactions, and transactions are what uh, I think are the first. You can call it like the first hop in which an account uh, sends something to an, an address, where the address is either a contract or another account, and. Um, the challenge is after that, uh, if you send it to a contract and tell the contract to do something, then internally the contract is, is ch making changes to, to state and, and doing internal messages, some of which may uh, be sending funds, like Ethereum, to other addresses. Um, now, uh, the challenge with that is that currently in the Web3 API, there is a get transaction, which does the first one. It, it shows you all transactions that come you know, from accounts. Um, two smart contracts. But usually what a multi-sig wallet is, is that you would send a transaction from one of the signers to the multi-sig wallet, and then the multi-sig wallet would then send out the funds from the smart contract. And that is a smart contract transaction or internal transaction. So there's no you know, RPC or API uh, to easily get a hold of those transactions. As a result, some of, some of the exchanges, uh, they don't recognize deposits automatically. For such for such smart contracts and and um, this I think will be further exaggerated because now we're moving towards what was that uh, unified the unified ID wallets mm -hmm. um, universal yeah, logins, yeah, universal login wallets uh, which I think I'm a big believer of from a UX standpoint um, but remember they are also smart contracts so we need to solve this problem uh, you know as an industry and and make more people actually take in deposits from smart contracts because that's what Ethereum is. It's about right. It's the, it's the smart contracts. Yeah, and it's a it's a scary thing to parse, process these too. Uh, you can have some pretty like dangerous sort of bugs that come up from doing this the wrong way. And so there's plenty of exchanges and stuff who don't want to do this yet because it, it is this sort of scary thing to get wrong. Whereas like transactions and stuff are fairly straightforward to kind of tell what's going on. Uh, these aren't. So it's a big risk, and and especially as we move to more and more sort of wallets uh, doing things, and these are going to have to be supported. And we need to make that easier. Yeah. That, that kind of flows nicely, actually, into the next one that I kind of wanted to throw out there. Unless, sorry, Morgan, did you want to go? Okay. Um, it's probably going to the same place. Yeah. So, so uh, all right. So, I guess the next question would be wallet contract or, like, scan individual blocks and transactions and invoke transactions. Which one, which one do you prefer? Yeah. And so, why? that is exactly where I was going with that. It is, there's pros and cons, right? So, either you're generating a new address for every deposit you want to take as an exchange and you have to monitor these internal transactions very, very carefully. Um, and it's, there's then, you have to sweep them into your, your hot or cold wallets and it's this big process or even so 
as a, as a contract side of things, if you build things as a contract, I think Bitrix does this and maybe some other ones too. Um, things like sweeping gets easier. You can monitor events in your smart contract, so internal transactions aren't a problem anymore. But now you have increased cost for each individual customer who needs to a deposit address but may never deposit any Ether in there. You have to handle tokens as a completely separate case, um, and it, it definitely complicates things, and there is that trade-off. Yeah, one of the things I don't particularly like about wallet contracts, uh, especially if it's like a single one, um, is that it sort of it puts all your transaction history in one place. And privacy is a really important thing and we want to have, and so contracts, especially this, and because of the cost, like you're going to be incentivized as any sort of business to do sort of one, right? Unless there's some extra cost or something for you know a new address, and if you have one, now all of your history to that exchange is in one place. And so anybody wants to see how much ether you had and how much you sent there, they can now tell that, and maybe how much you have in that exchange, maybe that makes them more of a target. Um, if they follow a pattern, like things like Bittrex's contracts, like you can detect them easily, and so you can easily see how much Bittrex is receiving through that pattern. Whereas like the way that we do it, um, which has some other downsides and costs, is like we generate new addresses just all the time. <laughs> like almost any time you get an address from us, it's a brand new one that's never been seen before. If we send transactions, it's coming from a new address that's never been seen before. Um, clearly that has some things of just having a lot of addresses, that's its own problem. And um, I think we might get into that later too about you know sort of batching transactions and stuff and doing a lot of sends. You, you have some interesting challenges there, internal transactions, but I think like I don't like this idea of just like linking everything together, all of your activity in one place, especially if you're going to like send from there too. So um, I think in terms of having one address per client, I mean per customer of the exchange, um, pretty much many exchanges are used to this concept um, from you know a variety of other digital currencies, and so I think on that matter, uh, what we're, we're doing is whether or not you're a contract or an address. Um, you got to have one, one address, you know, one, one address per, per downline, you know, customer deposit address. And so what happens in the end is that when you try and do that with contracts, you're, you're probably going to be using uh, some kind of forwarder contract in which uh, what it is is a really small shim um, that forwards the money from uh, this unique deposit address for each customer into some, uh, some main wallet. Um, and... Uh, you know, sometimes the challenge with that is, is uh, with, with us at least, we wanted to be a multi-sig uh, platform. And so we wanted, you know, all, all, all our wallets and contracts to be, you know, not controlled by a single key. And, and that was one of the requirements that we set out to fulfill, and that's why we, we did it that way. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, one, one, one advantage of that for, for us that we, I guess, haven't talked about is that with, with contracts, uh, you're... You know, instead of looking at the internal transactions by yourself by looking at transaction receipts, you can look at the events because you can get contracts to fire events, and um, and actually you can do it within the twenty one thousand gas limit. Uh, you can get one event or something like that, barely enough. Um, and then you can you can code your indexes to pick up those those events and use them for you know deposits. Um, so so there is one advantage there. The disadvantage is you know pay you have to pay the gas to to deploy the contract, um, which, which can be very costly. Um, and well, I mean, I think there are some EIPs that uh, are out there that are not too far away from being landed um, that will allow us to do, you know, basically pay to script hash. In other words, you can pay to an address, um, which is a contract address, without actually it having been deployed yet. And then someone else can then uh, deploy it after they see that, oh, okay, someone actually deposited there. And this is really useful in the case of an exchange that has you know, 100,000 users and only 50,000 may use ETH. Um, so you only need to set up the address after they, they deposit. You did bring up an interesting, interesting thing there, I think about like uh, the gas limit stuff, right? So this is a thing that different exchanges have to make different decisions on of customers sort of sending Ethereum somewhere. And if it might go to a smart contract, if it might not, and the trade-off of like, what sort of UI do you present there? What sort of gas do you charge your users? Because you know your standard Ethereum transactions are flat 21,000, you can sort of guarantee that. Whereas at least in the contracts, there's no guarantees necessarily. Um, there's things that you can estimate it, and it's probably right, but it might change too. There's some ways it could. And, and like that's an interesting thing exchanges have to do. Like us on, like, on our sort of brokerage of just Coinbase.com, you don't see any gas stuff when you send, and that's a very like intentional decision to keep it simple because it's a very confusing UX 
sort of design pattern, as I'm sure people have talked about in the design tracks here. And it's this interesting trade-off of like how to handle that. And as like a business, how do you set that and how do you sort of expose that to your users? Yeah, it's an interesting question for exchanges and, I mean, Coinbase, you kind of both, but both exchanges and wallets, really. Um, the same UX problem, really. It's the same UX problem that all of Ethereum and really all the cryptocurrency industry is kind of yep. going through right now. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's probably not just Ethereum, and, but we can't really just sweep it under the rug. I mean, the, the, the main issue, I think, really, is that customers are expecting to pay, you know, they're used to paying you know, fees which are a percentage um, or a flat fee. And in, in Ethereum and other chains, uh, you're really paying for compute or space. And not only that, it's an auction of block, block space or compute. Interesting. Um, all right, so I think, Jake, you had mentioned batching briefly down there. Um, do you guys want to maybe yeah. chat about that a bit? What do you think about it? Um, is it something that Ethereum needs? Is there some sort of al alternative thing that maybe would also be interesting to have? Yeah, I, th I think I only first brought up, we were sort of talking yesterday, um, and I sort of brought this up, and I hadn't thought too much about it deeply, but like I mentioned, we have a lot of addresses, and so we have all sorts of customers sending in all sorts of amounts, so you know, we'll end up with a lot of addresses with very small amounts of Ether. I will need to, so let's say we have a set of addresses that have, you know, one ETH in each, and we need to do, you know, a 10 Ethereum cent. Well, we need to sort of combine those into some other address, and then after that confirms on chain, all, you know, 10 transactions that might take, we need to, so we need to first send 10, wait for them all to confirm, then once they confirm, we can then send out this 10 Ether. So this, we, we call this like consolidation um, internally, and this is sort of a complicated thing to manage, and it's an interesting thing because like, like Bitcoin and sort of these UTXO chains, they have a different way of approaching this that doesn't have this problem. And so once you, in, in, one of the reasons they do that is so you can have sort of a new address for every sort of change at amount. And so you can basically always be using new things. Whereas like on Ethereum, it's really hard. And it's all about this privacy stuff again, mm -hmm. where you wouldn't want to do that because if you wanted to do a send, you'd have to do all these like intermediate sends to finally be able to do it. And so I think it'd be interesting to consider some sort of like batching strategy or like multi-transaction thing where you could say, you know, from all these addresses, I'll include all the signatures for them, do all these transactions at once into some like destination and have sort of one atomic uh, send there because also you probably don't want to do, because you could also, I guess another way, instead of consolidating and then doing I think, a 10 ETH send, you could do like 10 individual 1 ETH sends to that destination, but if it's like a payment service, they probably aren't going to handle that well if they're expecting 10 ETH and they get like 10 1 ETH sends, they're not going to know where it's supposed to go to, right? Pretty bad UX if, if yeah. a, a user goes to send one transaction and they receive <laughs> 10 on the other end. <laughs> yeah, that's probably going to confuse them. I think um, with, with Ethereum, actually, it's a bit, it's pretty cool in a different sense that in Bitcoin, you know that you have these unspents and you can tell whether each unspent is economical to spend or not. In Ethereum, you can almost say like, okay, if you got like some dust, you can just wait because remember, you're not spending per unspent, you're spending from the account. So, you know, if someone sent you a lot of, you know, one, one ways, you could wait for, uh, I don't know, a bazillion of them before you actually took it out. Um, uh, usually, I think, you know, consolidation is, is a good idea to just do it, like, when the, account, when, when the network is less loaded. So, you know, when nobody's holding any ICOs, well, right now, not many people are holding ICOs, but <laughs> on, on, on weekends or something like that, when, when, the, when the gas price is, is pretty low and keep it low so that you don't actually impact the network because uh, you very well could. One of the interesting things I want to, to ask uh, both of you here, uh, you know, what have you seen with regards to batching out outgoing transactions? So, you know, with, um, with, with, other, with other coins, and without getting too much into that, um, a common pattern is you wait every five minutes or 10 minutes, and you batch out a send, you know, of, of whoever else is trying to withdraw uh, during that time. Um, with Ethereum, this has largely not been done yet, even though it is very possible even today without making any changes whatsoever to consensus at all. Um, you yeah. can just use a smart contract and do a multi-cent. Yeah, uh, for, for me and, and like some of the conversations we've had about this sort of thing on Ethereum and Bitcoin, really any chain is this is, is privacy again, um, because like you, you now link all your sort of customers together in some ways and 
we want to generally prefer that. Like we like to sort of default to privacy and try and maintain that as long as we can. And so when sort of batching comes up in that, that's always the thing that, like I mentioned earlier about like wallet contracts, like putting everything in one place and maybe just Ethereum's the wrong chain for the types of things that that I'm talking about. And I think there's ways we can get there. Um, but for me, I haven't seen it. Um, and, and you can definitely pull it off, like you said, with smart contracts and stuff. Yeah, um, I think that's kind of the Ethereum for lack of a better word, purist answer to like the batching question is, well, why wouldn't you just use a smart contract for that? And that's kind of Ethereum's answer yeah. for everything, which isn't a bad thing, but maybe there's trade-offs that you don't want to make there in your in your server-side architecture that we, like, we so spoke you're saying about earlier. If you have a wallet contract, I guess it becomes very convenient to do these kinds of multi sins But if you don't, then there's no like alternative mechanism, right? Yeah, you could theoretically design a function call in your contract that would multi-send to okay. a list of addresses that you pass in. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And it's all technically the same Ethereum address, but then right. they just happen all in their internal transactions. Right. But then, like you said, they're all linked together. And well, you also need a balance. That's not what you, want. you need a balance on that account, too, that's like You're sort right. of public and probably associated with you in some way. So, like, you, like it depends on how you structure your hot wallet, but, like, you don't want to probably have all your money in one place. I mean, maybe, but... Yeah, yeah right. So the I thing mean, to think essentially, about. lots of... I mean, lots of exchanges end up with a hot wallet somewhere. Um, right. and, and I think for Shapeshift, it doesn't matter as much because you do like one transaction at a time, right? So you'd like to send that. But maybe one of the reasons why people don't use this as much in Ethereum is like, I think Ethereum people are, are really used to seeing a transaction where they have a source and a destination. Um, and if you look at that, like on Etherscan, you know, it's quite clear, right? It's always got a source and a destination. Um, so it's very one-to-one -one in, in how people, like the mental model, how they think about a transaction. Um, you know, in, in other chains, you, you always have multiple outputs. Yeah, it's also, I think, a little ne less necessary in Ethereum because, like, we, we talked about the non-stuff earlier. In Ethereum, you can do these sort of uh, serial but, like, back-to-back -back sends, uh, like, on from a single account, right? If you just increment the nonce, you can continue to, like, send from the same account. So you can you can queue up all of them at once without any sort of delay, whereas, like, on, on Bitcoin and that style of chain, you have to sort of, if you have a, a big sort of input of you have to sort of wait for that to do its thing and then do another one. Or There's other ways you can do it, but it's, it's a lot trickier. Whereas like Ethereum is just like, just keep sending from the same account and it'll let you do it. And like it should generally work. And it hasn't been too much of a problem we've seen where like any sort of need, need for batching yet either. I guess there's some like gas savings potentially. Yeah, I think, I think that, that like the gas savings, um, I think that with Ethereum, maybe we aren't as mature yet with doing gas optimization. Um, you know, with, with Bitcoin, for example, because things were so expensive, you wanted to save every little bit you could. So um, you're paying the same amount for signatures um, on the inputs. Um, and if you can send to 10 at once instead of one at a time, you, you, you do that, right? Um, but with Ethereum, I think it's still a little bit early with the gas savings. Now it's mostly like, how do we price the way, uh, you know, uh, gas price rather than actual gas spent? And really, right. all of these conversations change once, like, an actual Casper sharding, some scaling solution gets implemented. They're all just completely different because we have a whole new set of problems. And yeah, these yeah. Ones may not I, even I can't even anymore. imagine what that would be like with the with the sharded network. It'd be much more complicated. Um, I think I'm, I think we might switch gears here a, a little bit. Um, so uh, what do we got here? I guess I would love to talk about privacy with you guys. So. Um, how are you thinking about it? What do you think the status of privacy and fungibility is in general? Are we there yet? Um, what are some of the interesting prospects? And um, how, do, how do you trade that off with scaling? Well, I would say <laughs> that in terms of Ethereum, we're definitely not there yet for privacy. Okay. <laughs> definitely not there yet. But it's like snarks exist now, but it's, it's really not easy to use unless you have a PhD. And even then, it's, it's difficult. Um, it's... It's definitely tricky, and really they are, their best implementation should be in some sort of plasma-like implementation or in a shard of some kind. So it's almost a catch-22 in that which, which comes first, the scaling mm -hmm. of the privacy. Yeah, um, so I think it's not there, not by any means. Yeah. I mean, you can see how easy it is to track, you know, uh, I think on on Etherscan they have labeled like Shapeshift One. <laughs> there's a there's an address there which yeah. shows you know where you do your transactions through, and that's that's the most public thing I've ever, thing I've ever seen. Um, having said that, I mean I don't feel like you can really trust 
the so-called uh, you know pseudonymousness of, of Bitcoin, you can always almost think about it as those are, those transactions will be reviewed. Uh, when you think about privacy, it's not just about like privacy today. And okay, maybe it's a little bit hard to track today, but the blockchain is is forever, right? So so you going back going forward like five years later, all of that data is going to be there. So you're going to have to to live with whatever you're putting on on there today. So I, I think that secu you know, security is really important and privacy is one of, you know, one of those, those important things for security because it makes it just that much harder to secure something if you have a very big target, um, amongst other reasons. Um, so I, I, I just don't see this as something that is being worked on enough yet from Ethereum. I think that uh, we have scalability challenges and I think they're going to go after those first because... Uh, that is what drives adoption. I mean, whether you like it or not, uh, they want to drive adoption now. Yeah, I, I find, I'm really excited for sort of the prospects of like the future of privacy, but I, yeah, I don't think Ethereum is doing uh, maybe enough to, to be concerned about it uh, or to like, uh, there's definitely teams in the space working on sort of uh, off-chain sort of style solutions, which I think could be really interesting. Um, but just the general sort of blockchain community as a whole, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on, right? You know, there's all the, the Zcash and such doing all the snarks, and then there's, you know, Starks now and, you know, Bulletproofs and, and all sorts of things happening. But I think you brought up a really good point, Ben, about, like, uh, this sort of, like, foreverness, this sort of infinite sort of data thing. And this has already happened with Monero, where, you know, they had some sort of bug where you could, in theory, sort of, uh, I think in some ways you could, I don't know the details, but you could effectively, like, sort of de-anonymize some of their transaction history because of, of some sort of, you know, vulnerability there. And that's sort of already happened. And so in a lot of those, this new cryptography, it's also new. And, you know, most of the cryptography we're using is, like, fairly, like, well-established, tested and stuff. And so we do these, you know, security audits, but a lot of it's also still backed by this, this uh, there's a word for it, but this idea of, like, it hasn't been broken yet, and a lot of people have tried. We can't prove it's totally secure, but we think it's pretty good. And so we'll keep using it until then. Um, and a lot of the newer stuff, I, I imagine, would have like similar properties, um, except it doesn't have like it's not battle tested in that way. And so while there's like really smart people doing it and developing this stuff, um, I think that's a really like big sort of risk in general to it. Um, but I think it's definitely a worthy goal that we should we should go for as you know businesses and anybody wanting to build on this. Um, you know, I don't want my whole history to be for everybody to read. Anytime I send somebody something from any of my, you know, Ethereum wallets, they can uh, potentially see my whole transaction history. And I could split it up in all sorts of addresses and try and do that, but then it's it's like that problem we described earlier, even on like a just individual level, not even the exchange level of, well, that's really complicated to manage. And also expensive, just fee-wise. Um, cool. Um, all right, so, so another easier question here, but what are you guys most excited about with respect to Ethereum? Good question. Um, I would like as a something we would like to see in there, or as a, yeah, something, something you'd like to see some project that you think is interesting, or some you know future prospect that you're really looking forward to. I definitely think that for me, it it probably goes back to the whole nonce thing that we kind of started with. It's that's a one huge pain point and something, some solution to that, even at the protocol level, would be very nice. It's also something that Jake mentioned yesterday when we were chatting was, it was, there's this very interesting concept of, because we have, it's more of a solution to the internal transactions, parsing problems that we've had, where maybe we could implement events at the protocol level, like yeah. contract type events at the protocol level. Um, and I hope I didn't take the one you were going to say just now, but... No, no, I think, yeah, uh, we had, yeah, it's a really interesting idea, like, this, like, like, cause I think it's, it's a good way, cause, like, events are this sort of known entity and people know how to deal with them because of your C20 and 721 and they're gonna, you know, continue to be used and people will have tools and stuff around processing them in really interesting ways. And so I think that would be a really nice way that you could, you know, extend, um, you could bring these sort of internal transactions out of this sort of mysterious world um, that you need to parse to get them. And, and I think it's, that's one way. Um, yeah, um, I think it's a great, it's a great idea. I mean, when you look at it, um, what what people, or what a lot of people actually want is they want to see when Ethereum moves. Um, and there are a lot of ways that smart contracts can send that today, which don't get shown up with the get transaction API. So uh, I think ev events are one of those ways. If you can fire those events whenever whenever any ETH moves, um, that's that's a big way that that that, that will make it easier for integrators to see these, these transfers and credit deposits. 
Um, another way, you know, could be give them what they really want, which is a get transactions API, which actually gives them the transactions of all F. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and you know that's easier said than done, uh, but you know, I, I don't even know if it's that hard, right? <laughs> like we we've all sort of experienced this parsing of these traces. Like it's a doable thing. I mean, it'd be really easy to like write a tool that does this. Like it's it's not yeah. so much that it's like difficult. It's just that it's just kind of there's all these nuances that don't seem right. to be really it's documented. And so like uh, various uh, node implementations could absolutely implement these APIs, especially yeah. ones that have sort of custom ones. But I think what would be ideal is like a standard sort of RP RPC API that, that wouldn't require like protocol levels because I think yeah. that's going to be a lot harder to sort of sell. But you could absolutely yeah, just have an yeah, API Yeah, you wouldn't need this. any protocol level changes at all. We wouldn't need any consensus changes. It would be a new kind of a RPC API extension to Web3 or something like that. And I think people, you know, um, from, from someone that, that for us, because we care so much about platforms and having developers use platforms, um, you know, if they have to go for a talk like yours, uh, which also, you know, great talk, um, but if they have to go for a talk in order to learn how to do it, that's probably too hard. You, you want to just give it to them right away. Just give them the, the API and it should do what they want. While we're on the topic right. of things that I would love to see nodes implement is the, I believe it already exists in the EVM as far as I know, um, I think it came with Metropolis, is the returning data with a revert opcode. Being able to have actual error codes I can send back in my errors and not have to do extremely tedious solidity debugging for yeah, hours yeah. to find out my typo. So there was, oh, was there someone one. working on that? Hmm? I think there was a talk about that, right? Uh, I, have, I didn't see it this time. I'm sure there was. Yeah, yeah. trying to standardize, standardize the return codes. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. So, I know they implemented in Metropolis the opcode to actually return just arbitrary data, like you can pass a string to revert. Um, but yeah. I haven't heard anything for standardization. Yeah, I think there's someone working on it. I think it's really important. I mean, it's like kind of like you have HTTP status codes, you should have return opcodes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one other thing I think is interesting that would be, be cool to see, it's, it doesn't e exist, but it's is like some more sort of infrastructure or sort of tooling around like running nodes and running nodes in sort of like a, a high availability setup, right? Um, a lot of the nodes of today sort of expect you to run them in this sort of single configuration of just you have one thing running on one box and you expect it to never go down and never break. Um, and that's just not reality, right? These, every piece of software will break at some point and will go down and so if you're have a lot of sort of transaction stuff going through. Also, you can't just use one. Like, it just wouldn't work um, at the sort of scale that you may see. And so you need more than one, and then you get into all sorts of issues where you make a request to one node through a load balancer, and then you make another one, and you get a different result back yeah. because it hit a different node that's a different part of the blockchain. So you have to sort of deal with this in, in like interesting ways, whether or not you sort of take data from multiple nodes, put it on in your own database, and sort of handle that inconsistency there, or I mean, just run one node, I suppose, as an option. Um, there's a lot of choices here, but there's not much information on that. And I think other blockchains have other like proposed ways of running them in more of this like high availability setup for like if you want to build like you know reliable sort of infrastructure around these to make sure that you know nodes aren't your problem and you can just kind of focus on on the chain. I think we need some better tooling there. Yeah, I I think that sounds like a great grant project actually. I mean, think about it, right? Like, because we have, like, I think Ethereum is really cool. We have, like, the most clients, I think, of, of, of any blockchain, probably, most different implementations. Um, you could almost be, like, connect to the Web3 of Geth and Parity and be, like, a load balancer across both and, and only accept things that, that uh, both of them agree on or, or come up with. Yeah, we, we have an issue. Yeah. Yeah, we have, like, an interesting setup that kind of does that, but not about the agreement thing where we actually sort of chain them together. We chain together different node implementations so that if there is some sort of consensus yeah. breaking rule in one of them, one. it'll sort of stop there yeah. um, and not sort of get to our, the rest of our systems um, because like these things happen and this is a way to sort of mitigate them. And so yeah, trying to sort of detect consensus and detect like 51% attacks and things like that, there's probably a lot of interesting tools that can be produced out of there that I think a lot of exchanges and companies building are, are doing on their own, but there's no sort of shared um, stuff out there. That's yet. actually... Um, quite interesting, but also risky. Um, so when you look at like consensus breaks, sometimes uh, what people do is they attack uh, one of the implementations and cause it to, you know, maybe see a block as invalid when it should be valid. And, um, you know, the safest way, in my opinion, is to connect to both of them and then see if there's a substantial difference in the two 
chain heads um, by a, you know, a significant amount of work, right? Um, if you chain both of them, um, it's actually good in that you, well, kind of good in that you get the most valid one in that both of them will see it as valid. Um, but there could be something out there that uh, has more hash power that you don't see as valid. Um, so right, yeah, it's sort of it's sort of a, it gives up uh, what's it liveness, yeah. right? In the event of a chain split, it sort of gives up liveness since instead of like just keep running on and like hoping you're on the right side of the chain, um, it says we're just going to stop and we're going to figure out what's going on here and we're going to investigate it um, and, and then attempt to make the right decision there and, and catch up or whatever we need to do. But um, that's sort of that's a, I think a great point though. That is the sort of trade off it makes to do something like that. We're going to stop the world and, and until we figure out what's going on. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of thing? Okay. Yeah. Is the world weird? When that happens. <laughs> so. um, all right. I think uh, I'll do the, I'll do this last question, and then I would love to do some some audience questions if we have them uh, in the last ten minutes there. So um, we'll do an easy one, which is uh, uh, so what's your, so what's your favorite thing about working with Ethereum versus the other cryptocurrencies you've worked with, Morgan? Um, obvious answer, smart contracts, right? There's, it just offers so much more that you can do, so many more interesting creative solutions to a lot of the problems that aren't specific to Ethereum necessarily. Um, things like, it does offer its own share of problems, but, and, and really just the community. Like there's a, a huge community around Ethereum and building this out that does make it uh, never a boring day, right? Never a boring day. It's it's always interesting. There's always something new happening. It, it moves so fast that you you have to almost struggle to keep up with it sometimes. But it's a good problem to have. Yeah, I think that the community in Ethereum is this for me one of the strong, probably the strongest one. Um, it has, I think, you know, one, the most developers, um, which is a great indication for me as an engineer of where it's going to go. Um, I think that. In general, you want to build, when you build something, you want to see like other people are using it. So there is adoption as well. And you, you feel the most, you feel more welcome building something on Ethereum. Um, it's like, you know, hey, I built this and, and, and everyone likes to try it, see what kind of dApps you built. And I really, you know, I really enjoy that. Yeah, I, I think that's a big part. Uh, I think, yeah, similar answers for me is, yeah, I mean, the, the, what people can do with smart contracts, like I don't really do much work with them myself. But to see what people are able to produce, especially like all the recent sort of financial instruments and stuff, things like like die existing, and you know the ability to be able to create some sort of thing that has a stable value without anything actually behind it is this really interesting concept. Or all the stuff people are doing with you know uh, the the relays and, and all the the variants of you know loans and, and all that is somehow happening in this world, and it's kind of crazy that that happens. And you can just very easily go on to some you know some wallet app and instantly you know take out a loan or something and and that kind of works. Um, and then the community is, yeah, also a really, I think, generally healthy community and doesn't have as much of the sort of tribalism you might see across all different blockchains. Um, there's, you know, some of it, of course, uh, as there is anywhere. But generally, I find that the community is very sort of open and willing to work with other blockchains and stuff and try and push sort of everything forward. I think, like, one great example of this was the, um, the talk yesterday on verifiable delay functions um, that they're talking about doing in uh, Serenity is this... The, it's this thing that's not specific to Ethereum. Like they're actually bringing in other chains and want to work on this together in collaboration and come up with this just better cryptography and better system to you know have this you know new concept work for for everyone and not just be this like singular thing for Ethereum. Like it's you know our, our baby and we'll just you know keep it here and, and nobody else can have it. And they're just like let's let's share that with the world and let's you know make it all better because it's we're all it's so early days and all this stuff. There's a lot to figure out. And I don't know who the winner is going to be. And maybe we'll all be winners. Maybe none will be. But we want to, you know, all just work together and try and be healthy and, and get there. All right. Um, okay, so we'll open up to questions if anyone has any. All right. I'll just hop down here with this microphone and hand it to you. So you guys are on the front lines. I think you'll have a really good perspective on this. Um, I'm curious what you, which projects you guys think belong on chain, um, kind of where you draw the line for that. And, um, you know, as assuming that we improve efficiency and scalability and stuff, do you guys think that will change? And if so, how? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll talk first, I guess. Um, I, I have, I'm conflicted there. Sorry, I, I, I like on-chain just because it's sort of the singular place to integrate with. You know, the title of this is Integrating with Ethereum. 
and it's, as we've talked about, it's already sufficiently complicated. And, and the more things we add on top of that, especially layer two things and various protocols, it becomes even more complicated. So the sort of onboarding cost gets a lot more expensive and it's not as easy unless we build tools that can somehow do this. Um, but if you know now some new protocol comes out that you know all of the exchanges, all of the wallets need to integrate and you know you scale that up you know to multiple different ones, that's going to be fairly difficult. And so keeping it on chain, you know, has some nice guarantees there and just simplifies it overall. Um, but clearly that has sort of, you know, scaling and limits and stuff. And there's a lot that can be done off chain and, and maybe, you know, published there as just some proof. And I think there's also a lot of value in that if, if we can have, you know, really good sort of second layer solutions to, to pull it off. Yeah. Um, so I, I would give it like, I think there's a trick answer to that because you said on chain. I think like side chain right now is the best because... Um, well, you know, with side chains, with checkpointed into the main main net, um, you kind of get a lot of the advantages there um, of being on chain, and that it's really easy to integrate because people can see Ethereum transactions, and you've got an EVM on the side chain, so you can run quite a bit there. But it's not going to scale eventually. Still, um, I mean, a single DAP could still take up, you know, all the gas on its own side chain in the end. So, um, but for now, I think where we are at, um, that's 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 the best. We have, and it's going to get us there until 2.0. Yeah, I kind of see both sides of it. Like for simplicity, doing it all on just the main Ethereum chain is definitely the easiest way to keep it simple. And for scalability purposes, it's definitely nicer to do it on a side chain of some kind. There's, I think, some kind of balance there. Um, I would, at the very least, I think anything that should be anything that's considerably expensive. <laughs> I mean, you can, like, crypto kitties, anything that clogs the network or is sufficiently expensive or has sufficient network should be in some side chain or shard or something off the main chain, of course. Um, anything more simplistic that maybe either doesn't have traffic or, like, I'm not sure if it makes sense for, like, new developers coming in after, like, 2.0 drops and stuff like that should jump right into, oh, yeah, we're going to develop our... Thing right into a side chain. This is my first. My first DAP is on Plasma, and it it increases the barrier to entry for Ethereum, which is one of the things that makes Ethereum so great, in my opinion. Um, so there's a balance there, depending on in each individual app. All right. Um, so I think you, uh, your moderator asked a great question earlier about what was your favorite feature of, of Ethereum, but I'd like to ask the opposite. What is <laughs> the, the biggest pain point that you uh, as uh, scaling uh, Ethereum developers deal with. I know that Morgan from Shapeshift, you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, dealing with the lack of return codes was a pain point. Is that the biggest pain point? What's the worst part about dealing with Ethereum at scale? Well, so I think there's really two sides of that is there's the, the solidity side and the smart contract and what's a pain point of dealing with those and that, that whole ecosystem and then the server side architectures and integrating ad addresses or do we choose a wallet contract. Um, personally, having doing both sides, yeah, error codes is a huge pain point for me. Um, it, it's a huge time sink trying to debug issues there when you have essentially two, maybe three error codes that all basically say the same thing. It's definitely a pain point. I think it's the internal transactions challenge where other people are not viewing them easily for me. Um, because that, you don't have much control of yourself. Uh, you can, yeah, no matter how much time you spend yourself, you're not going to get someone else to accept the transaction which they can't see. Yeah, I think there, there's a few. Um, I, I think like that's a huge one that's like prevents people from sort of getting onboarded and getting there. I think there's like there's things we can do that will make that make that easier. And these are things that like eventually once you get them kind of working correctly, well, you know, they do become not so much of a pain point. Um, but they're hard to get right the first time. Um, things that we see like you know, regularly, oh, I'm going to say two things. One thing we see regularly, um, not much recently, everything's kind of died down, but all the gas price stuff. Like earlier this year, all the time, gas price is spiking, things get stuck, and, and that's a pretty big pain point, and we don't currently have systems um, on Ethereum that sort of automatically recovers that, and we talked about some ideas earlier that could help with that. Um, the other one, um, that, that's more of a rarity, but also similarly for like building these sort of high volume systems, if you have to start tracking these nonces and stuff yourself. And if you get one out of order, you're in a really weird spot because if you're doing like multiple sends for customers there and you like skip one, now you have, so if you have like four or five, six and you, you, for, you don't do five for some reason, you've got, a hole. you've got this hole. And so the other one's just going to be pending forever until you fill that in. 
And like, what if you like, I don't know, retried something else and then you send another transaction. Now, you can't cancel this six now. Like it's out there. And so you have this weird like, like we can't introduce like canceling transactions. That would be like not really possible. <laughs> but um, that sort of thing of like calculating these nonces, like you can't, because you're not just using a single node, you have to sort of track that yourself and make the right decision there. And so that's a challenge to like do right. And then when you get it wrong, um, specifically going too high, going too low, the node will reject usually. Um, it just depends where like your node's synced at. But um, going too high creates this thing where it's like, oh yeah, now what? And you don't know how long it's going to last. It's in the mempool. <laughs> we had a thing once where you know we filled in the gap and it went out. We didn't expect it to. And it's like, oh, well, I mean, it was okay, but <laughs> it's not, not a fun thing. All right, any other questions out here? All right, we got one way at the back. I'm going to run. I know. Um, you guys talked a little bit about um, better standardization. Sorry, better standardization for uh, like your server architecture or, uh, or smart contracts themselves, air codes. Um, where do you guys feel the governance process is for that? Are you guys talking one-to-one -to, -one to each other or is that on EIPs or um, kind of like how do you have those conversations together in the industry to, to get stuff done? Yeah, I mean, I'll just a good use question. one thing real quick on that. Like, that's, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to put together this panel um, is to get people talking and people talking public. I think there's a lot of sort of secrecy. A lot of things are shrouded and they, they shouldn't be and there's no real reason for them to be. Um, but I think we all we all approach things different ways. Like if we were to talk about how we all run our nodes or how we all do not stuff, I, I imagine we'd all sort of do it differently. And there's things to learn from each other there. Like I've already learned things talking about, you know, the contracts, the different trade-offs there and the way they do things and the way we do things. And I think the, the big thing is, yeah, at least get people talking. Um, I don't necessarily have an idea or I think the best place to do that. There's definitely, you know, some, you know, just every now and then you talk with somebody or reach out. But I think it would be really cool to see more sort of open spaces to discuss these things, and especially with sort of, you know, uh, like big participants in the network being able to contribute to those conversations. Maybe, I think it, it would depend on the company, because I think also companies like to do a lot of sort of protecting of, of their information too, and that becomes sort of challenging. Um, but I'm, I'm curious. It really is like, like all open conversation, and yeah. it is kind of, segmented that conversation right now, whether it's Gitter or Stack Exchange or conferences or GitHub issues. There's tons of places where a lot of the same conversations are happening, so I don't really know of any centralized place where this is all happening as of right now. Um, but it is all about really conversation and just seeing what other people are doing. This is a very new space and we're all kind of just figuring it out and a lot of things you almost have to learn from either experience or listening to somebody that did get the experience and made those mistakes already. I do think like it is interesting because it is the thing like I don't think ha or people talk about enough is sort of the the types of problems we were talking about today. I think a lot of the, the people working on the protocols and stuff tend to be very uh, low level and close to there and have you know specific ideas around how people are going to run nodes and stuff together. Um, but I think that you know at sufficiently large volumes, you you have to do it differently. And I don't know of a space where people really talk about that yet. So I think definitely E3 search would be an interesting place to to sort of discuss that, or ether magicians, or any of the sort of forms like that. All right, uh, we, got, we got one quick comment here. So. Um, just another vote in favor of just some sort of central group group chat. I don't care the venue, but when I'm having issues with like all these like holes and nonces and sending transactions and like all that stuff, just um, if we can find some uh, central uh, group chat where I can ask you guys question, that'd be really nice, so thanks. So there actually are a few, um, but at the same time, when they get too large, then people start leaving and start tuning out. Um, so it's a, it's a challenge um, what level of noise you want to be at and how much, uh, how public it is. Yeah, I, I think it would be good for us to do blog posts or something about this. So we've yeah. only got 30 seconds, I know the panel's out here, but to end on, a, on an interesting note, it sounds like there's a lot of challenges from a developer point of view. I know that's what you engineers love. Um, but what, like, why are you here? What's so exciting about you to be in this space in five seconds? None of the challenges are insurmountable and we're seeing the one to scale and the one to get better here. And I, I think the community is great. Like we were talking about, and that's why I'm here. Yeah. yeah that, I'm here for sort of the, the privacy and sort of ownership of sort of your own funds and you know, all the sort of developments there are like fascinating to me. All the sort of talks today about all the privacy and all the 
cryptography and stuff is it's interesting. I think it can just lead to a lot of you know good in the world and people sort of you know. Having all, right, all right, we gotta we gotta kind of wrap it up here. If you, Morgan, if you want to five seconds, real yeah, quick. Brand new set of problems to solve that haven't been solved before, and we can solve them together.